can use this later and make sure I dictate exactly, exactly what is said. <laughs> Great. Okay, awesome. Should we jump right in? Yeah, let's talk about what you want to talk about. Okay, so what are the origins of the democracy, the River Democracy Act? Well, Crystal, it was really written by the people of Oregon. You know, I've had more than 970 open to everybody town hall meetings. And I'm looking forward to coming to Deschutes County and have another one of those really soon now that we're able to set aside the masks. And uh, it's um, really about listening to people. And what we said is, look, <clears throat> Political change really doesn't start in Washington, D.C. and then trickle down. It's almost always grassroots up. And that's the way it was with the River Democracy Act. I said, I'm not going to write this bill in Washington, D.C., where everybody sits around in dark suits and, you know, sort of acts like they got all the local, they got all the answers, all the answers for everybody thousands of miles away. So I called upon Oregonians to give me their ideas of what rivers they wanted uh, to protect, their suggestions for the future conservation in our state. The response was incredible. In a few months, my staff got over 15,000 nominations, 15,000 for rivers and streams that Oregonians wanted to have get wild and scenic designation. And that's how the bill got its name. It was part of our unique system of government. It was river democracy. And for example, there were nominations for Tumalo Creek from a science class at the Pacific Crest Middle School in Bend, for Rough and Ready Creek from River Guides in Southern Oregon, for the Umatilla River and Middle Fork of the John Day by the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla. Indian reservation. And, you know, all these political types always say they believe in grassroots government. Well, now we're trying to put this into black letter law. And our proposal is getting a really good response. We had a hearing in the Energy and Natural Resources Committee went really well. And when was that? About a week ago. And do you remember the moment just briefly, like the moment this came on your radar, like when, when you knew like, oh my gosh, we need 5,000 more, you know, approximately 5,000 more miles of wild and scenic river. When you did know, it kind of come on your radar? When it came to me was in the last Congress, we were able to make a significant addition to the wild and scenic uh, system. Did it sort of by the book, you know, I. Um, bring it up in hearings in Washington, D.C., and come home and, and ask people. And when we got it signed into law, there was kind of a big party with everybody saying, hey, great work. And then they all said, what are we going to do next? And I said, look, we know that our rivers are also, in addition to being a treasure for clean water, for example, and guides and rafting and everything else, they're a big time economic engine for our state when we need it. And I said, all right, you guys, buckle up. I'm gonna go out all over to Oregon, every nook and cranny, and I'm gonna ask for your ideas and suggestions. And that's what we did. Beautiful. I was reading the bulletin, I think yesterday or today, and there was a little bit of feedback around um, concern that ephemeral waterways were named that maybe we don't actually call them rivers, maybe they're a gulch, maybe they're a stream, maybe they're a creek, and maybe maybe some of them were visited and they were dry right at the moment, which not surprising, we're in a drought. Some, some waterways are ephemeral, um, but maybe they still need to be included in the act. Can you speak, speak to that a little bit? Yeah, look, let's talk about the opposition and I entered into the record the letters we had gotten from Oregonians. And there was a big pile of people who supported them. And there was a modest people of people who were opposed. 
Simple. And I said, they're all from Oregonians. Yeah. All of them from for Oregonians. And if somebody's had 970 town meetings, I want every one of them considered. And I went through the principal areas of objection, and I'll just touch on all of them. One, uh, some said, well, what's going to happen with this and fire? We're having all of these fires. And we took extraordinary steps to protect our communities from the ravages of catastrophic wildfires. We did that by requiring the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management to develop and implement a wildfire risk reduction plan for each river corridor. The bill ensures thinning and carefully implemented prescribed fires to make sure that river corridors are basically fire safety corridors. Then some people wanted to know, were we protecting private property rights? And I said, gosh, look at page 16, line 17 of the bill, nothing in this act or an amendment made by this act affects private property rights. That's a direct quote, Crystal. And then some people said, what about water rights? And I said, look at page 17, line one, um, uh, page 17, line one and, uh, and 10. And what really helped us was we had a wonderful rancher at that hearing a week ago, Andrea Momberg, who testified on the legislation. And she said that she is a part of all the cattle groups and all the ranching groups. And this took care of wildfire, protecting private property, protecting grazing you know, rights. And look, I saw this picture too. And you know, I, I get the fact that there are these powerful people that uh, don't seem to appreciate the economic engine that recreation you know, is. Uh, the fact is there are waterways that feed major rivers in our state. And you bet we've had some drought you know, right now, but this has all been uh, discussed. We're gonna discuss it some more. Um, our witness at this hearing was not from the Valley, was not from Portland, but was from small uh, Union, Oregon. And as a rancher who's lived in a number of Western states, Andrea Malmberg said, we touched every single base. Fires, protection of private property, and protecting grazing rights. Every base of opposition, you guys covered that, it. That, that, that's correct. And the, the fact is the wild and scenic um, proposal specifically allows ephemeral intermittent um, screen, streams of the 16,000 miles of streams that supply public drinking water in Oregon, about 57% are ephemeral intermittent or headwater streams. So there's a lot of history for what we're doing as well. Mm, beautiful. Do you think any of the opposition um, I have a, a summary quote here um, from section four that was cited on um, one of your pieces of literature on your website. And I wonder if you think any of the opposition might have to do with this quote. This section provides that federal land managers can enter into co cooperative agreements with Native American tribal governments to administer wild and scenic rivers. Currently federal land managers are only encouraged to enter into cooperative agreements with state and local governments. Well, I, I think these tribal governments deserve a seat at the table. So I, I'm not going to go after, you know, somebody's motives, you know, on, on this. I mean, we know that there are some powerful interests, as I say, that just don't seem to share our views with respect to the importance of this big, um, a powerful jobs engine, which is recreation. And the other point that the hearing brought out, uh, Crystal, is we can do multiple things. That's the point you know, of our bill. We added additional fire safety protection with the fire uh, corridors. And we made it clear we were gonna protect these um, rivers. We didn't say, oh, who cares about fire? I've just been spending my time getting the Biden administration 
to recognize the danger in the West for the first time, for the first time of uh, multiple big fires at the same time in the West. And uh, just yesterday, they came out with a plan to put more focus on these Western uh, fires. So uh, I think allowing, apropos of your initial question, allowing federal land managers to enter into cooperative agreements with Native American tribes to help co-manage river uh, segments um, makes sense because it ensures they have a voice at the, at the table. And we've worked very closely with the tribes to make sure that this was part of the balanced approach that we were taking in the overall bill. Beautiful. Um, so readers are, are, are wondering, um, what can we expect moving forward? How, ma how many more rounds do we have to get through? What does that legislative process look like? Do we have an idea when we'll have a, a, fi a final answer? Well, we had a terrific first step. I don't think Oregon could have had a better witness than Andrea Mumberg. And my colleagues were kind of surprised. They figured that somebody would come from one of the big cities and um, have been a leader in environmental groups. And I said, of course, we value those voices. We also value the voices of our rural communities. So I, I was struck by the fact that uh, there weren't even very many questions that even touched on kind of concerns or something like that that we saw in the article that, uh, that you mentioned and Andrea Malmberg responded to. And I just uh, outlined uh, uh, this, uh, this whole question of uh, ephemeral intermittent streams. Beautiful. So, so do we think, is it 2023 before we'll have a final result or? Well, I, I'm very hopeful that we'll pass this measure, the River Democracy Act in this Congress. We had a very good uh, first uh, hearing. Uh, people saw how river protections really help our communities in multiple ways. I mentioned not just the drinking water, but areas like uh, fire. Um, Andrea Momberg talked about why this was so important to help um, her uh, cattle with respect to grazing. So uh, we're going to pull out all the stops and uh, I expect uh, my colleagues to have a major natural resources uh, bill. And by the way, my approach to legislation is you always keep your door open for viewers and anyone, no matter where they fall on the political spectrum, we welcome their input. And that's why I put in to the official record, I put in every letter from somebody who was in favor and every letter we got in opposition. Beautiful. And just briefly, what did the process look like? You had 15,000 submissions, it sounds like, and you had to kind of sift through those, just to, just to kind of a brief, how did that look to, to make well, the final list? We were kind of amazed that there was such tremendous interest. And what we tried to do is make sure that every single part of the state got a chance uh, to be heard. And, you know, we're going to keep uh, making the point that our doors continue to be open. But we had regular public meetings where we brought it up. We had various types of public outreach. We heard from literally thousands of Oregonians. We talked to anybody who wanted to. We um, sent to the uh, counties association specific information, invited their special group that works on these issues to work with us. And we produced um, a piece of legislation that has rivers from everywhere. And there were areas that kids cared about and seniors cared about and really good cross section of the Oregon. It was, it was Crystal, it was the Oregon way at its best. That's so awesome. With apologies, I've got to cut off. I've got to get on another call. Okay, beautiful. Thank you for your time today, Senator. Crystal, take good care. Thanks for your interest. Say okay. hello to everybody there.
Okay, thank you. Have a good day.